Let me tell a story. Once there was a young man who said to himself, this story about everybody having to die, that's not for me. I'm going to find a place where nobody ever dies. And so he said goodbye to his parents and his family, and he set off on a journey. And after several months, he met an old man with a beard down to here, wheeling rocks in a wheelbarrow off a mountain. And he says to the old man, do you know that place where nobody ever dies? The old man says, stay with me, and you won't die until I have carted away in my wheelbarrow all this mountain. How long will that take? Oh, at least a hundred years. No, said the young man. I'm going to find that place where nobody ever dies. And he travels on. And he meets a second old man with a beard down to here. This old man is on the edge of a forest that seems to go on forever and ever. And he's cutting branches off a tree. The young man says, I'm looking for that place where nobody ever dies. Stay with me and you won't die until I've cut off the branches of every tree in this forest. How long will that take? At least 200 years. No, I'm looking for that place where nobody ever dies. And he goes on and he meets a third old man with a beard down to his knees. And this old man is watching a duck drinking seawater from an ocean. Do you know that place where nobody ever dies? And the old man says, stay with me and you won't die until the duck has drunk the whole ocean. How long will that take? Oh, at least 300 years. And who wants to live longer than that? But the young man went on. And he came to a castle, a palace. The door opened and there was an old man with a beard reaching right down to his toes. I'm looking for that place where nobody ever dies. The old man said, you found it. Can I come in? Yes, I would be glad, very glad of company. Je me suis bien amusé le temps de ma jeunesse. Je me suis bien diverti autant que la noblesse. Aux quatre coins de la table, buvons vin rouge et blanc, buvons, chers camarades, en nous divertissant, en nous divertissant. And time passes. And one day the young man says to the old man in the castle, you know, I'd like to go back. Just for a moment, I won't stay. I just want to go back to see my parents or my family. And the old man says, but centuries have passed. They're all dead. Yes, but still, I'd like to go back if only, if only to see the town where I was born. And the old man says, all right, but follow my instructions very carefully. You go to the stable, you take my white horse, who is as fast as the wind, but you never get off that horse. If you get off that horse, you'll die. The young man gets on the horse and he comes to where the sea was, where the duck was drinking the seawater. And now it is as dry as a prairie and a little heap of white bones, the old man. And the young man says, how right I was not to stop there. And he goes on and he comes to where the forest was. And the forest now is pasture land, no trees left. And he goes on and he comes to where the mountain was. And the mountain is now as flat as a plain. And each time he says to himself, how right I was not to have stopped there. And then he arrives at the town where he was born. And he recognizes nothing. So the only thing to do is for him to return. And he begins the return journey and halfway towards nightfall on the road he sees a cart drawn by an ox and the cart is full of used pairs of boots and shoes 
And as he passes the cart, the carter says to him, Stop, stop. Please get down and help me, because the wheel of my cart is stuck in the mud. And the young man says, No, I'm in a hurry. I can't stop, and I can't get off my horse. And the carter says, Look, it'll be night in a moment. Night's falling. Please help me. And out of pity, the young man gets off his horse. And before his second foot is out of the stirrup, the carter grasps him by the arm and says, Do you know who I am? I am death. And you see all those shoes in the cart? Those are all the shoes I have worn out chasing you. But now I have found you because nobody can escape me. That story was first told near Verona in Italy many centuries ago, but it still applies to today. The inexorability of time, the inevitability of death, the desire for immortality, all that in a nutshell is still what interests us in that story. Here I tell stories about people I've known, often when they're dead. Sometimes I say to myself that the storyteller is death secretary. When you tell a story about a life, you try to touch its meaning, the meaning of that life to hold it, preserve it, against the onrush of chaos. Secretly or openly, we all know that there are meanings, moments, forces, which seem to us to outlast time. Rembrandt was, amongst many other things, a specialist painter of ageing. He also painted the so-called woman bathing. In fact, it's one of many, many pictures he made of Hendrici Stoffels, the great love of his life. It's a painting about the eyes, endless rediscovery, always as if for the first time, of their own love of the body they are watching. In another painting, Hendrici is in bed. I reckon the painting was painted a little before the birth of Cornelia, Hendrici's daughter with Rembrandt. In all, they will live together for 20 years. In two years' time, Rembrandt will be declared bankrupt. Ten years before, Hendrici came to work in his house as a nurse for his two-year-old son from his previous marriage. Hendrici will die, although younger than Rembrandt, six years before him. It is late at night. She has been waiting for him to come to bed, and he has just entered the room. She lifts up the curtain of the bed with the back of her hand. The face of its palm is already welcoming, already making a gesture which is preparatory to the act of touching his head or his shoulder. And the curtain she is holding up divides two kinds of time. The daytime of the daily struggle for survival and the nighttime of their bed. Rembrandt painted the picture because he remembered how Hendrici greeted him. It was a retrospective image. Yet the picture shows the moment of her seeing him. It is on his appearance that she is entirely concentrated. In her eyes, 
we can read her portrait of him. And we are now looking at this image 300 years later. There is such a tangle of times contained within this picture that it is impossible to place the moment portrayed. Where is it? It is a moment beyond the time of clocks or calendars. And one would feel a kind of pity for somebody who therefore said, it is less real. Such images do not only happen in art, they can happen in anyone's soul. The word soul is taboo, but the soul is what pierces time. And people go on loving in the very face of mortality. It is June 1919, and a red hussar is about to take a train from the railway station in Budapest. The new Socialist Republic of Hungary is under attack, and he has been called up to defend it. Almost certainly, he believes that it is his duty to do so. He is saying goodbye to his wife, who is holding their child in her arms, and something of the drama of the situation is perhaps already there in the difference between their clothes. His for travelling and sleeping out. Hers for staying at home. How close a parting is to a meeting. But people remain ingenious. The ingenuity to use the little that is at hand to preserve experience, to make permanent. Hundreds of millions of photographs, fragile images, often carried next to the heart or put beside a bed, are used to refer to what historical time, according to the hearts of those concerned, has no right to destroy. Once, a tortoise and a hare were arguing about which of them was faster. So they decided to have a race. For the hare, the outcome was a foregone conclusion. He almost forgot about the race, lay down by the roadside and went to sleep. The tortoise, painfully aware of his slowness, padded along without stopping, passed the sleeping hare and won the race. Who's telling the story? Not the hare, not the tortoise. Esau, the old magician. There is no way of comparing the time of the hare with that of the tortoise, except by using an abstraction which has little to do with either of them. The lifespan of a hare and the lifetime of a tortoise are prescribed in their cells according to a very different rhythm. It was man who introduced a common, abstract time and then organized a race to see which of them would reach the finishing post first. The time of the galaxies has nothing in common with the time of the butterfly, except that man observes both of them and then invents a time 
to place them both in. But with this time, man, like no other animal, can tell the story of the creation of the world. Do you remember when the wood beat its wings like a butterfly on the first night of the world? Last night. Man is always between two times. The brief time of his mortal body like the tortoise and the big story time that his mind invents, constructs. But the same mind can also deconstruct and undo, undo that time. And this happens when he remembers, when he foresees, when he listens to music, when he dreams or when he tells stories. Once upon a time, Why have storytellers always been rewarded a little? They produce nothing, fiction. Yet even in the labor camps of Siberia, prisoners were prepared to give a little of their scarce bread to a fellow prisoner who told them stories in the evening. Yes, the story distracts, takes us out of ourselves, entertains, as we say. But there is more to it than that. When once the story has begun, we listeners find ourselves in an eternal present. The time in the story goes beyond, far beyond the time of the telling. Perhaps storytelling began with the night sky. Those who first named the constellations were storytellers the great bear, the twins, the water carrier. And tracing an imaginary line between a cluster of stars gave them an image and an identity. And then the stars threaded on that line were like characters and events threaded on a narrative. The idea that all life is a story told is a very old one. Ce soir, l'envie me prend d'aller voir ma maîtresse. Je la trouvais au lit où elle gémissait sans cesse. Oh, qu'avez-vous, la belle, qu'avez-vous à pleurer Nos amitiés, la belle, N'en sont-elles point changées? N'en sont-elles point changées? Barns here make everybody think of time. After the haymaking, a barn is full. Now it's empty. And it's the same every year, except for the disastrous ones. At first, they are solid with packed hay. And then they're filled only with light and have to be refilled again. And all this for the animals during the winter, the animals down below there in the stable. A 10-year-old cow is already old and you can double it for a horse. But for the peasant, his animals every year, except for the disastrous ones, are an unbroken, continued presence. When a cow is slaughtered and is replaced by another, the new one is often given the same name. The goat is dead, long live the goat. And that's why every shepherd knows that the herd outlasts the herdsman. Yet animals have little sense of time as we understand it. They wait down there in the stable, and there are holes where you can drop the hay down into their mangers. They wait patiently to be fed. But this patience 
is not quite what it seems to be. For cows, as for most animals, time, insofar as it is experienced at all, is experienced more like space. All their senses alert them to what is happening here, there, rather than today or tomorrow. Animals can be frightened, they can experience pleasure and pain, but they have no anxiety for tomorrow, so they need no philosophy, and they don't know anguish. Once in the 14th century in Central Asia, there was a wise man called Bahudin. For the first part of his life, he looked after cattle. Then he became an advisor of kings. One day, the king of Bokhara sent a message to his sage, Bahudin. The message said, please come at once. An ambassador is arriving, and I must have you at my side for consultations. Bahudin replied that he could not come. He said that he was enjoying the air of the place where he was, and how could he possibly bring it with him? In a bottle? Hearing this, the king became annoyed, and even though Bahudin was a very important sage, he decided to tick him off for his lack of courtesy. Now, as things turned out, the ambassador's visit was cancelled, so the king didn't have to deal with Bahudin after all. And one day, months later, the king was sitting at court when an assassin leapt at him with a knife, and Bahudin who had just entered the throne room at that moment, jumped upon the assassin and disarmed him. Bahudin, said the king, in spite of your discourtesy, I am indebted to you. And Bahudin replied, the courtesy of those who know is to be available when someone needs them, but not to sit about waiting for ambassadors who are never going to arrive. Prophecy challenges our common sense view of time. But the great men of wisdom perhaps approached something like the confidence of animals when they saw time laid out as if it was space. The Roman Emperor Tiberius was a very powerful man. He employed an astrologer whose name was Thrasyllus. And he, Thrasyllus, he advised him about what he should do and when and how. Now the trouble was that Tiberius became frightened that the astrologer's power was becoming greater than his own. He became frightened of that man and he wanted him killed. So he called Thrasyllus to him and asked him whether he was able to predict the date and time of his own death. Thrasyllus left Tiberius, suspecting that the emperor wanted him killed. So next day, he came back and he said to Tiberius that he had consulted the stars and his astrological charts and he thought he knew now when he would die. Then he added, you, Tiberius, and myself were born around the same time. And if I die on the date I have predicted, you will die on the very next day. And from that moment on, Tiberius was too frightened to kill Thrasyllus because his own life depended upon him. This barometer was given to my father on his wedding day, the 6th of February, 1926. And I was born nine months later, on the 5th of November, 1926.
Several years ago, when my father died, I made some drawings of him in his coffin. To draw somebody who is dead involves a great sense of urgency. What you're drawing will never be seen by you or by anybody else again. People talk about the freshness of vision, the intensity of seeing for the first time. But the intensity of seeing for the last time is greater. Of all that I could see before me then, only the drawing would remain. And I was the last person to look on that face. And I wept as I tried to draw with the utmost objectivity. His life was now as finite as the rectangle of paper on which I was drawing. But within it, in a way infinitely more mysterious than any drawing, his character and destiny had emerged. I was making a record, and his face was already only a record of his life. If I look at the drawing now, I scarcely see the face of a dead man. Instead, I see aspects of my father's life. Yet if somebody from the village came in, he would only see a drawing of a death mask. My drawing is unremarkable, but it works in accord with the same hopes and principles which have led men to draw for thousands of years. It works because from being a site of departure, it has become a site of arrival. Every day, more of my father's life returns to the drawing in front of me. Drawings reveal the process of their own making, their own looking. To draw is to look, examining the structure of appearances. A drawing of a tree shows not a tree, but a tree being looked at. From each glance, a drawing assembles a little evidence, but it consists of the evidence of many glances, which can be seen together. If one accepts the metaphor of time as a flow, a river, then the act of drawing, by driving upstream, achieves the stationary. A photograph is static because it has stopped time. A drawing is static because it encompasses time. Appearances are a construction emerging from the debris of all that has previously appeared. But a drawing, by preserving that construction, gives birth to the hope that the flux of disappearance may cease. And such an idea is more than a personal dream. It has supplied the energy for a large part of human culture. For example, the story triumphs over oblivion. Music offers time a center. A play reinvents time each night. And the drawing challenges disappearance.
One day, a farmer was on his way to the town of Biela. The weather was foul and the going was difficult. But the farmer had important business, and so he went on despite the driving rain. He met an old man, and the old man said to him, A good day to you. Where are you going in such a hurry? To Biela, answered the farmer, without slowing down. You might at least say, God willing. The farmer stopped, looked the old man in the eye and snapped, God willing, I'm on my way to Biela. But even if God isn't willing, I've still got to go there all the same. Now the old man happened to be God. In that case, you'll go to Biela in seven years, he said. And in the meantime, you'll jump into this pond and stay there for seven years. And suddenly, the farmer changed into a frog and jumped into the pond. Seven years went by. The farmer came out of the pond, turned back into a man, clapped his hat on his head, and started back on his way to market. After a short distance, he met the old man again. And where are you going to in such a hurry? To Biela. You might say, God willing. If God wills it, fine. If not, I know what is going to happen. And I'll jump into the pond of my own free will. Of all the weapons we have against the inexorable flow of time, music is perhaps the strongest. Once I was in a train going across Germany to Amsterdam. I'd been invited there to speak at a conference. And the subject, believe it or not, was hope and despair. Anyway, I was sitting in the compartment alone with my radio cassette. And I was listening on tape to a Beethoven sonata. And suddenly, I said to myself, maybe I don't have to speak at that conference at all. Perhaps I could just play them this sonata. And at that moment, I saw, making signs, through the glass of the door, in the corridor, a man, elderly. And I understood that he wanted to come in. So I opened the door and he sat down opposite me. And then, together, we listen to the music, to the whole sonata. When it was over, neither of us spoke. Silence. Then he told me his life story. But he told it by making signs with his hands occasionally writing a word or making a crude drawing. Of course, he could hear, but he couldn't speak. He was dumb. And Beethoven, when he wrote that sonata, was deaf. People everywhere have always dreamed and told stories about the good time before the bad time, the bad time of the present. The Golden Age, the Garden of Eden, the time before the fall, the time before consciousness, the time before time. And if we didn't believe that somewhere on the way, 
something had gone wrong or something had been lost. Life might seem too bitter. These distant dreams of a golden age help us to come to terms with living in the present and with our irrepressible desire for happiness. The Adams and Eves, continually expelled, and with what tenacity, returning at night. Before, when the two of them did not count, and there were no months, no births, and no music, did they feel a prickling behind the eyes, a thirst in the throat for something other than the perfume of infinite flowers and the breath of immortal animals? In their untrembling sleep did the tips of their tongues seek the bud of another taste which was mortal and sweating? Did they envy the longing of those to come after the fall? And still women and men return to live through the night all that uncounted time. And with the punctuality of the first firing squad the expulsion is at dawn. In a dream, nothing is insignificant. We can dream of terror, but never of the absurd. When we dream, we have the sensation that what is happening and what will happen has already been decided. Past and future coexist. And here again, I think of some lines by Adonis, perhaps the greatest living poet writing in Arabic. Let me try to explain why. In the Egypt of the ancient pharaohs, Mystery was acknowledged in the origin of everything. Today, in face of the rationalist view of evolution, this mystery has been displaced and now lies between what we can feel and what science tells us. The abyss of mysteries is now inside us. How can we cross it? Only dreams and the poetic can cross it. Metaphor has again become our guide. I see myself wave. I see you beach. The half continent of your back. And the four points of my constant compass beneath your breasts. 20 years ago, I saw a photo by Lucien Clerg, one of a series of photographs of women in the sea. For millennia, the look of a woman's body in water has changed no more than the look of the sea. In the Egypt of the pharaohs, in ancient China, this could have been seen. Today, scientists estimate that life first appeared on the Earth 4,000 million years ago. The story began with the coming into being of single organic molecules. And these were produced, mysteriously, by the action of ultraviolet light on certain mineral elements. Then, after many, many attempts, and it's very hard here to avoid the notion of a will, after many, many attempts, the first single organic cells eventually gave birth to something capable of reproduction. So it took 4,000 million years to produce the form and surface of the human body. Yet the camera records this image in less than one hundredth of a second. In the next village, there's a war memorial. A 
stone angel holds the wrist of a soldier who's slumping into death. The angel doesn't save him, but appears somehow to lighten his fall. And the angel's hand, which holds the soldier's wrist, takes no weight. It's no firmer than a nurse's hand taking a pulse. On the plinth below are inscribed the 45 names of the men who fell in the war between 1914 and 1918. Then, on another face of the plinth, 21 further names were added after the Second World War. Seven of these last were deported and died in German concentration camps. Others were machine gunned within earshot of the war memorial. All were in the resistance. Some, before they died, were tortured in the Pax Hotel at Anmas, the local headquarters of the Gestapo. Did the guardian angel with the nurse's hand appear in that renowned hotel? Or in the camps of Mauthausen, Dachau, or Auschwitz? Amongst these men, many at different moments had a vision of a morning in the future when they would walk again indelibly scarred but carefree through the village of their country which had been freed. The stone angel, if she represents anything at all, perhaps represents that morning. Amant, j'ai bien entendu dire parler de ta conduite que tu devais partout, partout, dans ces auberges. Aussi, je dois la belle, ne t'y fâche pas. J'ai de l'argent en bourse, je payerai fort bien. Je payerai fort bien. Sometimes the moment in the future which we need in order to have the courage to go on is more personal. And then, intimately, we make promises to ourselves. These promises are neither truths nor lies because, strangely, they exist outside time. I had a friend, a Chilean, Orlando Letelier. He liked music. He was very witty, debonair, and he had extraordinary courage. This poster tells his story. He was a minister in Allende's government. And uh, when Allende was murdered and the government fell, Orlando was arrested. Then he was put in prison and tortured. And after quite a long while, he was released, but of course had to leave Chile. And he traveled around the world, talking about the fate of his country. And he persuaded certain governments to reduce or to stop trade with Chile. Up to the point when Pinochet decided that he should be got rid of. And so uh, the secret police of Chile planted a bomb in his car in Washington, United States. He drove off in his car with an American girl who was acting as his secretary. The car blew up, the girl was killed, and Orlando, after he had lost two legs, died. I heard the news of this assassination one night, and uh, early next morning, Eve, my son, was born. Orlando dead, Eve born. Anyway, 
it seems to me this poem is part of the story and something to do with those promises I was talking about. Once I will visit you, he said, in your mountains. Today, assassinated, blown to pieces, he has come to stay. He lived in many places and he died everywhere. In this room, he has come between the pages of open books. There's not a single apple on the trees loaded with fruit this year which he has not counted. Apples the colour of gifts. He faces death no more. There's not a precipice over which his corpse has not been hurled. The silence of his voice, tidy and sweet as the leaf of a beech, will be safe in the forest. I never heard him speak in his mother tongue except when he named the names of patriots. The clouds race over the grass faster than sheep. Never lost, he consulted the compass of his heart, always accurate, took bearings from the needle of Chile and the eye of Santiago, through which he has now passed. Before the fortress of injustice, he brought many together with the delicacy of reason and spoke there of what must be done amongst the rocks, not by giants, but by women and men. They blew him to pieces because he was too coherent. They made the bomb because he was too fastidious. And what his assassins whisper to themselves, his voice could never have said. Afraid of his belief in history, they chose the day of his murder. He has come as the season turns, at the moment of the blood-red Rowanberry. He endured the time without seasons which belongs to the torturers. He will be here too, in the spring, every spring, until the seasons returning explode in Santiago. In the worst periods, a poet representing millions of people can whisper an order to the future. An order to say, take note of what is happening today. And this was the case of the Soviet poet Agmatova. Here is a photograph of her when she was alive. And these are photographs of her funeral in 1966 in Moscow. Her husband was shot soon after the revolution by the Bolsheviks. During the Second World War, she remained in the sieged city of Leningrad, where two million people died of starvation. Her own son was arrested and sent to the camps. And she became the poet of all that suffering. In a poem which she finished in 1940 called Requiem, she whispered to the future. She is standing with 300, 400, 500 other women in the street outside the prison of San Qua in Leningrad, waiting like all the others to have news of the men taken away. And this is the story of what she whispered. If one day in my country they want to erect a monument to me, I agree, but on one condition, that it not be put up on the Black Sea where I was born and where now I have no connections whatsoever. 
and let it not be put up in the Tsar's park where the trees of my childhood search for me still. Let the monument be here where I have waited for 300 hours and the door always shut. I am frightened that even in merciful death I may forget how the engine of the black lorry of terror ticks over, how the hated door is slammed, how the old woman screams like a wounded animal. Let the monument be here, and from its eyelids of bronze, my tears will fall like melted snow. Far, far away, the pigeons of the prison will murmur, and the boats on the Neva will pass in silence. I saw a child carrying a light. I asked him where it had come from. He blew it out and said, now you tell me where it has gone. 